Hi everyone, welcome to the daily study group where we are exploring the Wolfram plugin for chat GPT. I'm Jamie Peterson of Wolfram U. Today we'll be looking at solving computational problems and generating Wolfram language code using the plugin. We're joined by Jason Sonnenberg and Michael Trott of our Wolfram Alpha scientific content team. They have a lot of very important content to share with us today, and we've extended our session to a full hour to allow time to go through a good number of examples and also to get to your questions and comments. And then uh, Jason and Michael do plan to leave uh, about 15 minutes at the end to uh, respond to the questions that have queued up and so they can share those uh, those responses with the whole audience. So that's all I have. Thank you very much for uh, joining us and I'm ready to pass things over to Jason. Hello everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today. I will be doing some examples related to the chemistry domain, um, mostly focused on chemical education, but in the end, to, as a segue over to Michael's talk, we'll hopefully get to an example or two that actually has the uh, chat GPT generating code. So I have a new uh, chat GPT window here, and I'm just going to start off with a simple question. So I'm just going to ask it what a particular molecule looks like. Note that I already have the Wolfram plugin enabled, and I didn't give it any other prompting besides this. And so what's going on is it's making a request and is giving our information back. So we didn't ask for details of the molecule. We just wanted to see what it looks like. And it added both text and went out and made a call to Wolfram technology to generate the structure. Normally, you would be able to do multiple queries in a chat. Then the next thing I'd say is um, show me that same molecule in 3D. And it notes to go ahead and again make the call. We can see what it's doing. Here it's building, you know, it wants the 3D structure of phenyl. Got back its answer, and it should give us a picture. Now, anyone that's worked with uh, the Wolfram Alpha um, tools, you can see that we've been able to, we're basically doing, it's doing Wolfram Alpha calls under the hood. These aren't terribly complicated, but uh, if you are tasked with teaching new folks uh, chemistry, visualization is a big deal. So um, for the chat bot to be able to do that and get images is, is actually a big deal. More, something more complicated, is looking at the different ways that chemists render molecules. So when we're thinking about things in 3D, because we can't go in and, and zoom in with a microscope, uh, well, most of us can't zoom in with a microscope to look at individual molecules, uh, we have these 3D representations and the different information is conveyed in them. And so being able to see what's known as a space filling, the ball and stick, which we saw previously for fennel, uh, the tubes and wire frame plots um, next to each other is, is quite helpful, and especially if you're teaching chemistry to show you know, what the different representations are doing. Um, and here it looks like, well, there's something wrong with the code. So let's go over and see what it tried to do. So it, it, wrote, in, it wrote code. Um, it seems to have done something odd in its query. So we'll let it have a look at what it's doing next. Note that it's while it's building the, the Wolfram language code, it's commenting it along the way. So after it finishes and gives a response, you can always ask it for the code that it uses, and it'll usually spit that back out in a nice formatted um, box with the comments that it's built up along the way. So it's now executing this, and hopefully we'll get an image. Hmm. Well, that's unfortunate. It was just doing this earlier today without any issues.
So let's see what it does. But this is a good example if you haven't played with ChatGPT or e even with or without the plugins. Um, it's a probabilistic model. So what you get back at any time is not necessarily what you got the previous time you did that uh, query. I'll let it go just a little bit further and see what it does um, before we can switch over to the queries that I did this morning. I can just show you um, the results so you get a better feel for the breadth of what it can do, particularly with our plugin enabled. Hmm. Okay, I'm going to stop it while it seems to be spinning its its proverbial wheels. And let's see. When I did the same um, query this morning, what it did is it went and made a call, and we can see that here it got it knew to get the entity for Allison, and then it went and made a graphics row and pulled up the different um, plot themes that it that it wanted and rendered the picture just as you would expect. And not only did it render the picture, then it explained which each of these structures are, which really is the important part if you're uh, teaching students. All right, um, let's try another one. Now, since the chemistry functionality in the Wolfram language is relatively new compared to the age of the Wolfram language period, um, ChatGP doesn't always have a, a very verbose understanding of some of the new functionality, such as here in molecule plot and molecule pattern. So in that case, I'm going to tell it, go, go get the information about that because it can, has access to the documentation and then go plot the phenyl molecule with the OH group, uh, otherwise known as a hydroxyl group for the chemist in the audience uh, highlighted. Let's see what it does. So it should make at least uh, two, possibly three calls, uh, first asking for the documentation. And that's what it's doing here. It's asking about molecule plot. And then it should go and ask for a molecule pattern. And then hopefully it'll do a third query that will generate the, the structure plot that we will ask for. Again, the reason I'm having it read in the usage statements um, sort of gets away from the fact that ChatGPT just automatically does anything that you want it to do. But as I said, because of its training data, we're reading in new information and then uh, it uses that quite fluently to do much more complicated things. So as a workflow, particularly in chemistry, since our function functionality is relatively new, I found that this is very helpful. Now here it went and built the structure and it almost got it, but it didn't do the molecule pattern very intelligently. So it, here it did the molecule pattern using uh, an incorrect um, smile string. And if it was, ha if it was handling more than uh, one input per chat field, um, I would tell it, oh, your, your smile string is wrong, go correct it and it would, it would go fix it. Let's see, we can move on to some other examples, let's see, we'll try the empirical formula. And I'm just gonna show you what, what happened uh, this morning. So if you look at the web notebook, um, I've been, I shared the prompt that I've been using for a lot of the chemistry efforts that I am sharing with you today and have been uh, developing over the last weeks. Um, I find it very helpful to be very explicit and say that you want chemical formulas typeset. Uh, ChatGPT is fully capable of doing that, and sometimes it will completely ignore you, but if you're persistent, it will come back and generate some very nice laid out uh, responses. Um, and so there's, there's really no excuse for it to not typeset things as one would want as a chemist. Um, but anyway, so I appended the prompt to the query, which the query is this last bit here. So, you know, we've got a chemical, we want to know the chemical formula for this particular um, percent composition, uh, elemental percent composition, and it goes back and it explains correctly what you're going to have to do is you're going to convert that to percent composition to grams, assuming 100 grams, and this is how we would teach it in, in a standard chemistry course at either high school or college level. Um, so, and then it, it goes on and it does the calculations. Here it tried to do it all in well, one fell swoop uh, with a call to alpha, and it, it, that didn't work. Uh, then it went back and had 
had some problems with its code that it put in. Um, so that didn't work. And then it finally got it, got it right. And here, it, again, it built Wolfram language code from scratch with comments, put it in, and got back out the, the correct formula, the C4H5N2O. So this was the percent composition for caffeine. And uh, the molecular formula would have the C8H10N4O2. But this is the empirical formula. And so it did that correctly. Now, one of the other problems that comes up not only just in introductory chemistry, but in as part of nearly all of chemical research and chemical problem solving is balancing a chemical equation. Let's see. Um, give it a whirl and, and see what it does. So I'm going to copy in the prompt. And you'll notice that it says, let's do some chemistry at the end. That's just, uh, as I found, if I gave it the rest of the initial prompt, it would also want to explain back to me, oh, yeah, I understood. Here's some examples, blah, 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 blah. Uh, so by putting, let's do some chemistry in there, it seems to be less verbose in telling you that, sure, I understand what you just told me. And I append the, what I want to do, in this case, balance this particular reaction. Now we'll see if it actually followed the prompt because I told it just use balance and then follow up and then the chemical reaction. Because if you get to a very long chemical reaction with multiple species as reactants and products, um, it sometimes will just, it, it can be a, a long input so we can uh, keep it shorter by just this instruction. And here, unfortunately, um, there were too many requests. So sneak in and get it again. Otherwise we'll go pull up the one that I've saved from this morning. Ah, here we go. So we can look at what it did or is doing. And it said, yep, it followed its instruction and did balance with the, the formula. Um, and it's also paying attention to the, the type setting. Here, this is not text that's coming out of uh, uh, from Wolfram, but it's you know the narration that it gave. And let's... Now, the other information that it's giving about the equilibrium constant in the rate of reaction is information that it got back from the query, and it decided on its own accord to share that with us. Some days it does, some days it doesn't. Um, so that's, that's, that's interesting, as again, reflecting the probabilistic nature of the tool that we're using here. Okay, well, let's, let's try um, a little bit more complicated. Um, we'll do a conversion. And here we're using the fact that this is a measured quantity. So something that was measured out in the balance in a laboratory. So it has an uncertainty. Uh, in this case, uh, 0.1 milligrams, which is standard analytical balance. Uh, uncertainty in the, you know, we measured out 7.23 grams of sucrose and you need to convert that to moles, presumably as a first step of a stoichiometry problem. And so here, um, it chose not to subscript the chemical formula. I also didn't ask it to, but it sometimes will do it on its own, but quite rarely. And again, it went and it uh, grabbed, it knew to grab the molar mass, and then it um, did the division or set up the division, typeset the instructions, much like you would see in our step-by-step -step results from Wolfram Alpha, and then it presented the error. And it was smart enough to realize that it needed to propagate the uncertainty as well, and so it, um, it did that. Now, for those that have used the Wolfram language, we have an around object that would do this automatically, but it didn't choose to use the around object. Uh, it, it just knew to do the math on its own, which is pretty impressive, actually. All right, um, let's do, we can look, do the reverses of an empirical formula. Here's where I'm saying, again, what is the mass percent of hydrogen in the molecule ATP? And so it went and just asked for that and then processed the results 
and correctly returned that you've got 3.18% uh, hydrogen in, in ATP. Let's go on to... Let's do a pH problem. So here again, I gave the more explicit um, prompt uh, because here, this particular problem, it's an equilibrium problem. So it's going to need to do an equ uh, balancing the chemical equation, possibly some stoichiometry, possibly um, uh, an ice table. That's this initial change equilibrium table. And so I, I used the full prompt. And, and it, it, here's what it did. It, it laid out the chemical equation. Now, granted, it laid out the chemical equation with the appropriate phases of matter that were carried over from the prompt, but it ignored, in this case, to typeset things properly. It did give the table, um, which is commonly seen in textbooks these days, and it set up the Ka expression on its own and uh, went through and figured out the quadratic and then tried twice to get the quadratic, but it eventually uh, got the syntax right and solved. Now here, um, well, this syntax may be, you know, the, the values here may be comfortable for uh, mathematicians. Some chemistry students get a little turned around with solving the quadratic uh, exactly and carrying this around, uh, but it's Mathematica, so we don't need to make the approximations that are sometimes taught in the textbooks. We can just let the machine do all the math and in fact, that's what it does. It, um, it first, yeah, it, it takes the log and yeah, there's something wrong with the, the first input, but it got it right the second time and, and returns the results. So this is a pretty complicated um, multi-step uh, problem. A related one is the, here we're doing a solubility problem. Again, another equilibrium problem with multi-steps. Now this time it, it paid attention a little better and it typeset things correctly, um, but it walks you through using the KSP and the molar masses and see, it's setting up the equations and typesetting them quite nicely, putting together your KSP equation. Screwed up with the formatting here, um, but it uses the stoichiometric coefficients correctly and And let's see if this helps. Sorry about the small font size. And then it goes on uh, to solve the calculation. Now, here's another case where it chose to uh, write code and pass it all in. And then um, come out with the answer. Yeah, so I'll just stop there. If you look at the... Um, cloud notebook there's a couple examples where i was earlier in the week getting it to do some pretty nifty um manipulates so i it i told it to you know build up some functional groups and then using representations in the wolfram language and then use those to do plot uh plots highlighting the different functional groups and then at the end build a manipulative uh to let the students explore uh, highlighting different functional groups in a large molecule. Uh, I think I'll stop and uh, turn it over to Michael to show his side of um, what it can do with more coding than, than I did. Okay, thanks very much, Jason. Okay, so we have already heard a lot about ChatGTP and various components and I want to quickly summarize some of them. So you can do it for a wide variety of things. You can just have a quick calculation that just makes a call to Wolfram Alpha. You can generate code, non-trivial code. You can correct code. I will show some examples. You will, you can tell it to comment code. Say you've got code from somebody that you don't know what it does. And the Wolfram plugin, if you just superficially look, looks like one object, but behind it's actually the Wolfram Alpha API and the Wolfram Language API. And you can actually specify in your prompt which one it should use. And uh, I want mostly to emphasize some examples of generating code. And I had a recent community post where I showed quite a few examples that you can generate. And there are many straightforward one-line inputs that you can give like 
how many calories on a cubic mile of butter and it will do nothing else than make a quick call to Wolfram Alpha with this query, get us back and formulate the answer. And similar with things like what's the ratio between the logarithm of the volume of the universe divided by the volume of the earth, which is pretty much one of the defined structure constant. And you can go on with ChatGDP having a philosophical discussion if this is accidental or not, which is pretty fun and entertaining to do. But the real power, in my opinion, of the plug-in comes when you start to do things that are far outside of what Wolfram Alpha can do. Say you take something, make me a log log plot of this LCM and this LCM for arbitrary n, and it will go on and produce the plot. And if you look what happens, and Jason had already shown various examples, here is Wolfram language code that gets sent to the Wolfram cloud for evaluation. And you can do this in a wide variety of topics. You can say like, take all English words, say from dictionary lookup or word data, and give me the ones that are the longest where all letters are sorted alphabetically. There might be gaps, but they cannot go backwards. Or you can do things like you have three dice. What are the probabilities of obtaining every single number? And we will come back if I have time to dice by the end. And you see it made a little bit from language call with basically just two lines to compute these things. But the real power comes actually when we come to prompts. And Jason had already emphasized uh, how important the prompt is for chemistry. And you really can't underestimate the importance of the prompt. If you go to Google Trends and look, the number of prompts in search queries is exponentially increasing basically since the beginning of the year. And recently have been headlines, if you're a good prompt engineer, uh, hundreds of thousand dollars are totally possible for you. So prompt engineering is a very complicated thing and you can influence what the thing does, how detailed it does it, which tools it uses, how it does it do step by step, uh, the style, if it adds summaries, you can, can do it in English, German, and one of the most important things is you can tell it to do recursive work, something like do this after you're done, evaluate your work, do potential improvements or do it and then run a couple of test cases. If they fail, go back, fix your work and it will do this very faithfully as long as its memory is not exhausted. Concrete things that I find very useful for generating work from language code are things like Write your code with proper indentation, not one long line, so that I can better read it. Add comments. Uh, before you write the code, explain what it does. Be really careful. This sometimes makes actually things even more correct, interestingly. Uh, break everything down to the minutia. Then execute the code and show me what comes out. Uh, normally, it makes just simple patterns, as we all do in daily work f of x underbar, but you can say it's only defined for real is greater three, so it will make underbar real, question mark, pattern test, and so on. You can tell it to use certain word from language function for your task. You can tell it not to use certain language function for your task. Uh, you can say, don't worry about efficiencies. You can say, be very efficient. And as Jason had already shown, interesting decapitalization methods. It's a little bit like a not always obedient child. And in other case, you have a better chance it will really obey what you want it to do. For many of the things that I will show, uh, I use more or less versions of this, uh, saying first develop the code, then run the code, and then the result of running it. Sometimes a little bit uh, more details. So let's look at some examples, what we can do. Say this one. And I say in the prompt, I want you to mimic a dialogue between a math teacher and a very skeptical and naughty student. And uh, the, the problem is there are eight poodles in a litter and they have a total weight and they are geometric progression. And what are the weights of the individual little puppies? And then, of course, it goes on and it says, good morning, class, from the teacher. 
And then the student really questions every single thing, which makes it actually a little bit entertaining to read. And in between, it try, starts writing the code, as I told it to do. And then it sends the code to Wolfram language for evaluation. And then it makes this some formula for a geometric progression. It solves it. And then it gets the values. And then you can say, check the values and go on. We will give it this famous Helios cattle problem. We are saying this sun god Helios had a herd. And then comes this complicated description. And it makes very nice symbols up for the things that a human would basically do. It writes down the equation. It just silently calls it using solve. And then we see it gets a solution that has a constant and then makes its own inference that the smallest solution is the one with c of 1 equal 1. You can do some more messy things. You can say, give me, give me the eight first partial sums of exponent, plot them, plot the differences. Do a closed form sum of the truncation of the series, which gives a gamma function. And then you say, do asymptotic expansion of this, then you get the error. So that's pretty nice how uh, ChatGTP and Wolfram language are working together to do some slightly non trivial problems. You can say there's a relativistic baseball of 0.999c. What energy does it have compared to the US electric energy production? So it will make the relativistic energy formula, we call Wolfram language, then it will get, the, uh, if you look, it will get the energy production of the US, which it got from an earlier call, and then it divides everything and gets out 2%. We can ask it some slightly, I think this one, yeah, you can ask it, take all US states and give me the countries that are closest in area and by population. This will also form a little piece of Wolfram language code, evaluate it and nicely form it, the result. A yeah, slightly more interesting one. Uh, find me the smallest 10 prime numbers that are greater than 100 and are also Fibonacci numbers. And uh, there are two possibilities. Either it first, uh, forms primes and look if they are Fibonacci or if it forms first Fibonacci's and look they are prime. Because we have prime Q that quickly checks if something is prime, but we don't have Fibonacci Q, uh, one of the two approaches is better. And in this case, it used the more efficient one. But if you run this 10 times, you get three times where it decides for the opposite and then, then has a hard time actually figuring out by reverse engineering if a prime number is a Fibonacci number. And the reason that it can write a pretty decent Wolfram language code is that it understands Wolfram language actually remarkably well. And here are a couple of examples that don't run any code, but here's a definition, f of x underbar, integer, real, complex, and then run something. And you ask it, predict what would come out. It's actually a fun game to play, with, in my opinion, with ChatGDP. Give it a piece of Wolfram language code, tell it not to run it, but to predict what happens. And it does a remarkably good job. Obviously, it doesn't get everything right because the evaluator is a complicated beast, but it does pretty well. Or here, uh, here's a pattern with double underbars, so there are multiple matches. And what are the things that it would return? It, it, it's not a complete list, but it got it in spirit right. This one I find pretty good. Uh, why does a plot of uh, 80s order Hermite polynomial multiplied by exponent minus x squared uh, have so much noise. And uh, the reason is because the Hermite polynomials order 80 have coefficients that are larger than machine numbers. So we get cancellation. And it has learned this probably from reading some stack exchange mathematical posts, I assume. So this gives a couple good ideas. Uh, let's see what else. Oh, this is an interesting one. You could say something like, come up with a fictional story between Wolfram, Stephen Wolfram, discussion with a C programmer, the advantages of procedural versus functional programming, take the Euclidean GCD algorithm and write some nice text. And it pretends Stephen Wolfram writes this text, which is nicely recursive and basically what you should find in math books and then compare this with what a C programmer would do. So I find it entertaining to add a little bit of context to the whole discussion. 
let's do some more examples. Here's an interesting where it has to retrieve data. I say uh, a long prompt, what I wanted to do, what to send, what not to send. And it says, okay, it always is very obedient and very polite, no question. And it, I, I want to find an allometric scaling law between the maximum height and the maximum weight of male dog breeds. Because we have a dog breed data. So it goes on and retrieves all the dog breeds and then uh, gets rid of the units. And interestingly, it doesn't know what the properties are named. So it makes a call to interpreter and asks like, if I have a dog breed and what I'm interested in is the heaviest male, what do I have to call? If, the, if I can touch this, yeah, here. Male maximum height, which gives you the appropriate entity property. Then it gets the data. Then it normalizes the data. And then it gets rid of the units. And finally, it does the fit, the linear model fit, which is better than just taking a look. And you get uh, approximately 2.5, which is not unexpected because the volume of a dog is in the very first approximation proportional to the third power of the height of the dog. Let's see how we're doing in time. Let's skip a couple examples. This one I find pretty neat. Uh, I it's, a, it's something where probably if you have not a lot of experience in constructive geometric solid geometry, will take a couple minutes to write the code. Take initial red pentagon with the edge length six, centered at origin and discretize it. Then place randomly blue polygons of edge length one on top of it until you don't see any red anymore. And then I say we'll use region union, region difference for the geometric computation. You don't have to say this, then it will start writing its own code and will get very complicated. But so this works pretty well. Let's see what comes out if we would run this. So this is the code, it runs. And here is, here's the piece of code it generates. Pretty decent, nicely commented, not too long. And then uh, I changed, uh, I added this print statement that I see what happens and you see it does this. And you need around in the order of 500 times to call uh, or to put a blue polygon down so that you don't see the red one anymore. Let's see. How are you doing time? I should slowly come to the end. So there is a new kit on the block that we just added last week to our, our API, which we didn't have earlier. And that's the following import. Import is now allowed. So you can instruct GPT. T, ChatGPT to go somewhere, import a web page as PDF, HTML, CVS, uh, JSON, whatever's your favorite format, and do something with it. So, again, my standard prompt carefully document what you're going to do. And what I wanted to do is the following import uh, the titles of uh, last week's archive quantum physics papers and make me a word cloud of the most common things. So it faithfully goes to work. It writes the code, imports this, then spring, spring, spring splits, uh, takes the title text out, uh, takes the title word out, and then concatenates everything to have one big input, string joins it, and then calls word cloud on it. And then from time to time, you will see this, then it has a glitch. Uh, when it sends things to the Wolfram cloud for evaluation, sometimes it gets problems by the formatting of white space. So it typically fixes itself and tries again. And in this case, it timed out because it took too long to evaluate it on the cloud. But if you let it run locally, you see it works perfect and you get a nice word cloud by the end of the day and not unexpected in quant pH. We have quantum entanglement, non hermitian very hot topic, variational quantum circles are very hot. Well, all the things we would expect. Okay. And now, yes, let's do how much? I have two, three minutes. Okay, so one thing that I find very, very important is to tell it, do things and check it. So do you know what Foul Harbor's formula is? Foul Harbor, famous German mathematician, developed this form formula for the sum of the piece power of 
integers around 1631 when he was in Ulm. So this is the thing he developed. And this is the formula he developed in modern notation with Bernoulli numbers. And in this time, uh, ChatGTP got it right. And I say, compare with an explicit sum. It does it and say, oh, all worked out. I got the right number. All right. You do this again, and things might not work out. The reason being, there are various conventions for Bernoulli numbers in the world. And so it has seen various formulas of this. And here it chooses a one that's the minus one to the k missing. So this formula does not work out. So it runs it. It sees, oh, does that not work out? I have to go back and fix it. And it goes back and see, ah, I see. I forgot the minus one to decay. I will insert it. It runs it again, and it uh, gets it right. This I find one of the most useful things that ChatGTP can do for me to fix things. And maybe one last example. So I saw this morning when I do my morning archive math read, this nice thing. How close can the sum of two n-sided dice be to a uniform distribution? So we had in the beginning the example of three dice, which is very non-uniform. So if you could rig two normal dice, how good could you rig it that it becomes nearly uniform? And I was seriously impressed when I sent it to GTP and say, okay, solve me this problem. So I have my standard prompt, do everything very careful, and then it starts. Okay. Let pi the probability of this dice, qi of the second, sk of the sum, and it gets this all in the first shot, absolutely right. Then I say by the end I must call and minimize. And here we have the, the code. So these are the various probabilities from sum 1 to 12. These are the constraints. The total sum for each dice must be 1. And every probability for each side must be less than 1. Then you run it. And now we go back to Wolfram Cloud, and we get these numbers. And you say, make me a histogram after, say, a million tests. And it is not totally uniform. It's not possible to get a uniform distribution. That's why the question was, what is the best approximation of a uniform distribution that you can get? And this is what you get. Yeah, I was deeply impressed. I run it the second time. It didn't get quite so well. It made a little mistake here. It made a P here and a P here without the symbol. And then, of course, it ran into recursion. But it detects this and fixes it on their own. Okay, and I think I should probably end so that we have at least 15 minutes for question and answers. Michael, I, maybe you could comment a little bit on the import function since you had a couple examples of it. How much does it does the chat GPT learn from that information? It obviously can process it, but uh, does it is that is a it very learn good or does it hold it in memory for a long time? No, uh, the import is totally uh, on the Wolfram Alpha or Wolfram language client side. So the import happens within the Wolfram language session, and then you process it, and then you give something back to ChatGTP. So ChatGTP does not do any import on their side. But is it aware of the text that it spits back to you? Is that kept in no, its tokens? No, no, no. Okay. No, so this is a hundred percent within the Wolfram language program. And I see one question about the quantum computing package. Actually, I spoke yesterday with the developer, and uh, we are working on teaching ChatGTP to use some of the quantum computing package. So you can say, make me a little circle that makes a GHD state or something like this. I'm going to max a, a question that I thought was pretty um, interesting. Um, Brad did provide a, a response to this, but this is uh, pretty interesting how you can ask ChatGPT to help you generate the code. If you want, if you can decently describe what you want to do, and this decently describe does not have to be short, this can be half a page, and in some sense, even the longer the better. ChatGDP will do a decent job uh, writing the code you want. Not a perfect job. And you might have to go back and say, rethink, is this really the most efficient thing to do? Do you really want to use append to here? And it will say, oh, actually, append to, you're right. It has uh, O of N. I should probably use association or so or reap. And you say, okay, go ahead, and it will do it. I see this one question. That's a great question. I'm having trouble finding the code in a notebook. 
That is an excellent question. I've never tried this. It should be able to do this. The reason being, ChatGTP cannot just generate pull from language code. You can tell it generate a notebook, and it will literally make notebook open close of curly uh, cell group data of cell of comma. So it can write the underlying data structure of a Wolfram language notebook. And because it can do this, it can also understand it. So you could, in principle, send a notebook to it. Right now, you can't because it doesn't have an API. Uh, but this won't be a matter of time. And then you could say, here's a notebook. Where in this notebook is this and this? Assuming the notebook is not so big that it exhausts uh, JetGDP's token limit. Michael, there's a, a good question I think we should address. Um, Andrea says, we have seen a lot of prompts followed by large results. As far as I know, ChatGPT sometimes hallucinates and might lack functional correctness. How can a user verify if the results are meaningful and correct? Do I need to be a subject matter expert? I have thoughts on that, but I'll let you go first. That's a good question. That's why I think I always tell it, uh, run a couple of test cases. Test cases that ChatGDP can make up or test cases that you yourself make up. But you're totally right. By the end of the day, you need a human to look at it if, if it does do the right thing. That has you, been you my cannot trust it. Yeah, that was my experience with chemistry too. Having the Wolfram plugin greatly increases its accuracy. Um, but even um, if you look at my cloud notebook with more of the demonstrations that I didn't do today and the rest that I did, um, there's always a key section showing the actual answer. Um, it can be sometimes very difficult, even as um, a, a chemical educator and a, a longtime practicing chemist, to catch some of the subtle mistakes it makes along in a calculation. And if you happen to give a prompt, for example, with chemistry of solve this chemistry problem and just give me the answer, it you it can be very difficult to tech to 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 know if you've gotten a correct answer uh, without it previously knowing the answer that you should get. So. That is a bit of a drawback at the moment. That's one question for you about DFTs. Uh, I didn't see that. Can, uh, does the plugin have DFT functionalities? Uh, no, not at this point. Another note on the, the previous question about the hallucinations. Uh, if you Sometimes if you prompt ChatGPT to be particularly terse in its responses, it will start making things up more frequently because there's less to yes, go off of. Yes, So I know this if, is you, if you ask it to solve a set of equations without the plugin and you say, be as concise as possible, it, you know, it, it's producing less content of its own and the num it sometimes just completely makes up numbers. Um, so just another element there. Yeah, at least for the- One thing that- Oh, go ahead, Michael. One thing that I think we have not enough explored yet and just, I just did a couple of little things is take some medium-sized problems. So nothing ridiculously complicated, not like the DFT current state of copper. Uh, say a 1D Anderson model for localization due to disorder or a Hofstadter butterfly. And you ask ChatGTP, write me Wolfram language code uh, to make a quick visualization of this. And it does write pretty decent code because it not just knows world from language, it knows also a fair amount of physics, chemistry, and other things in the world to, to assemble some, something interesting. But again, as just said, from time to time, there's a little glitch there. It's not 100% foolproof. I see a question. You have two math equations that are equivalent. If it's something that is in the order of, say, polynomials or tricks, it will do the right thing. If you give it some non-trivial identity uh, between a Horvitz setter and the Riemann setter, no. Can ChatGDP correctly give a block of Wolfram language code terminate? That's a good question. I played around with this with very simple replacement rules. And it does do an okay job. Not a perfect job, but this this... As we know, this is undecidable and it's in general hopeless. Uh, how does the plugin decide uh, when to call Wolfram language? Uh, so every plugin, and we know there are a dozen right now, has to come with a manifest and it's a publicly available file. And this file tells ChatGTP 
when and how to call the plugin. So our one says, if you need factual data about uh, economy, chemistry, physics, if you have a math problem, then call this APIs. And then based on this, maybe page long instruction, ChatGTP will then later on at runtime make the decision when and if to call a plugin. It should we consider systematically debugging ChatGTP answers? From my experience, that is hopeless because I was running this example with the foul harbor, some formula, maybe 20 times. And it is remarkably creative coming up every time with a new version that has in the initially a problem. So the space of problems is really, really large. That, or the, 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 not a problem, the space of possible answers is very large. So I don't think one can even remotely cover it in some way. There is no validation. So there's a handshaking with some secret keys exchange between the both ChatGTP and the Wolfram plugin. But uh, otherwise, everybody does what, what it's supposed to do. So ChatGTP gives us a piece of Wolfram language code. We evaluate it and send it the result back. And uh, ChatGTP accepts this, uses it, throws it away. It's, it's up to them. <laughs> 